All right, prayer. All earthly things with earth will fade away, but prayer grasps eternity. But I'm convinced of this, God does not hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer. Prayer is not a position, what do you need? Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a secret into your heart that breaks you. And somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. Amen. Amen. That's a good bumper video. That was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones giving us an intro for prayer. I had something set up, uh, an intro that I was going to uh, kind of give here this morning, but I thought it would be appropriate based on, I know Michael already kind of touched on it, and really through our time of worship, Pastor Dustin has talked about this, but I thought it would be appropriate as I'm about to embark on teaching on prayer, that instead of yapping, that we would just get to prayer first. You know, that's the thing about prayer. You need to stop talking about prayer and you need to get to prayer and pray. But in light of everything that's been happening in our nation and as, as we look to um, this political turmoil, you know, what I see this week is that there's spiritual turmoil. There's spiritual turmoil. We need a, a church to rise up at this hour to pray. We need to be known more than just talking from pulpits about prayer. We need to be a church that is known for praying. That if anyone on this block would know us for anything, that we would be known as a church who genuinely seeks the face of God. And so here's what we're gonna do. It's pretty simple. Let us pray. Let us go to the Lord right now, right where we're at. If you're online, right where you're at. And I want us to pray for our nation. I want us to pray for our president. I want us to pray for our leaders. We're gonna learn today that God hears the prayers of his people. But let us go right now to the Lord in prayer, if we can. Let us just bow our heads, just give it a few, 30 seconds to a minute, and then I'll close this in prayer. Oh, sovereign God, mighty King, merciful Father, at this hour in our nation, Lord, we are calling out to you. We need you, God. We need to be a people who seek the face of God in prayer, who earnestly and diligently and persistently seek God. We're in spiritual turmoil in our nation. We have elevated other things and made them gods, and we worship them. God, remove all of our idols. Be the king of our lives, the king of our hearts. Lord, may we care about seeking your kingdom first. Oh, Lord, may we be a desperate people, a needy people a people who value prayer more than the air that they breathe. So now we come to you, we acknowledge you, we start with you, we've lifted you up in worship and, and in giving, and now, God, we lift you up yet again, and we intercede prayers of supplication on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our leaders, on behalf of our president. Lord, may you create in them a new heart, a clean heart. May they fear you, Lord. Save them, transform them, and use them to make your glory known here on earth, just as it is in heaven. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you're new this morning, I want to welcome you to our church. My name is Pastor Arthur. I am a church planning resident here, but I also have the privilege of leading in worship and our outreach ministries. And man, God really showed up yesterday at our Love Your Neighbor event, and uh, he, he, someone got saved yesterday. So praise be to God. Yes, we can give a praise for that. 
someone came to know the Lord, and, and God is just doing an incredible work right here in this church and in our community, so I praise God for that. But I just want to welcome you. If you're new, if you're watching online, welcome. We're glad that you're here with us. We don't take that for granted, and we want to connect with you. I know we've already talked about that a few times, but it means a lot to us for you to connect with us because we want to walk alongside you in this journey of faith. This journey of faith, this following Jesus thing, it's not made, made to be done alone. Uh, we need each other. And so we just pray that you would connect with us so we can walk alongside you. But I also want to take a moment uh, this morning to just tell you uh, how grateful I am for our pastor. I really am so grateful for our pastor. Pastor Dustin is, is my pastor, and he's been my pastor for quite some time. But he's also my dear friend and my brother. And I can tell you, church, with full assurance that I would not be the Christian that I am today without my dear brother Dustin. I love him so much. He is a servant. And oftentimes as pastors, pastors pour out their time, they sacrifice their time with their families, and they're constantly pouring into us, right? Constantly. But rarely are they poured into. And so this year, I just want to acknowledge him. The Bible says give honor where honor is due. And Pastor Dustin has led us through one of the most difficult seasons of the life of this church and the most difficult season politically and with the pandemic. And so if we can just stand to our feet this morning and, and if you're online, just put some clap emojis. Let's stand up to our feet and just thank <laughs> Pastor Dustin this morning. We love you and we're so grateful for you. Thank you, brother. Amen. You may be seated. We love you. We love you. Church family, it's a privilege and an honor to, to share with you God's word this morning. I take the office of pastor seriously, but I also, um, I, I think it's really important to handle the word of God rightly, and so I pray that the spirit of God works through his word this morning. As Dustin and I were considering what to talk about in these first two weeks, um, prayer was the first thing that came to mind. We have a, a praying pastor, a pastor who believes in the power of prayer. And so we were talking about that and ushering in a sermon uh, that kind of will teach us how to pray biblically. But as I was looking back to 2020, as I was looking back over this, these last few weeks on what God taught me most in my Christian life in 2020, it was easy for me. I think the, e, the, the, the one thing that God taught me most in 2020 was how to pray, was how to pray. I thought I knew how to pray until 2020 came along. I've been on a 12-month journey of learning how to pray. Have I arrived? Absolutely not. Have I learned to pray with more intentionality, with more awareness and intimacy and dependence on God? Yes, I have. I absolutely have. Thanks be to God. But last year, January 2020, the Lord put on our hearts to, to plant a church in Sanford. So we were trying to figure out what we were going to do and and the Lord taught us a really important lesson right from the start. And here's what he taught us. If anything is going to happen, it will happen after prayer. Let me say that again. If anything is going to happen for the glory of God and the expansion of his kingdom, it's going to happen after prayer. So we were trying to embark on this impossible mission without God to plan a church and so the first thing that we saw in scripture is to seek God in prayer that we needed to first have a prayer gathering and just begin to pray how God would use us to, to do ministry in this city and so that's exactly what we did we started a prayer gathering no fancy name just prayer gathering and we started a website called prayforsanford.org and all we did for months was pray all we did for months was teach on prayer so that we might have a healthy prayer life. But here's the interesting thing. As we started to kind of get into ministry, God began to do crazy things, ridiculous things, as Wanda would say. God was working in our midst as we began to pray. But here's the interesting thing. People would ask me, hey, Pastor Arthur, what's your church planning strategy? 
And I would tell them, prayer, we pray. And they, they would look at me as if I hadn't prepared enough, as if I hadn't done enough. Prayer was our strategy. And here's what I realized about last year. This church planning task that's ahead of us in our church all the ministry that God has for us in this community in 2021, here's the thing. We can't handle it on our own. We need God. And so I don't want to make that abstract. When I say we need God, what I'm saying is we need to pray. We need prayer. Prayer is essential for us as a church. Prayer is essential for us as Christians. You know, last year we learned a lot about what was essential, what businesses were essential, which ones were to stay open, which ones were to close down, and you can have an argument about this, but I know for sure this as a Christian, that prayer is at the top of the list. Seeking first is prayer. Prayer is at the top of the list. Prayer is our Christian duty and privilege. Pastor H.B. Charles Jr. wrote it this way. I'm going to recommend a lot of books to you this morning. There's a book called It Happens After Prayer by H.B. Charles Jr. You're going to want to pick that up. But Pastor H.B. Charles Jr. writes it this way. Prayer is our Christian duty. It is an expression of submission to God and dependence upon him. That's a really good definition. For that matter, prayer is arguably the most objective measurement of our dependence upon God. This is really good. The things you pray about are the things you trust God to handle. The things you neglect to pray about are the things you trust you can handle on your own. The things you pray about are the, th the things you pray about are the things you trust that God can handle. But the things you neglect to pray about, friends, are the things you trust that you can handle on your own. So the greatest way we can start this year is to submit to God and to depend on him through impudent prayer. And there is no better passage in the Bible than Luke 11, 1 through 13, that teaches us not only the priority of prayer, but teaches us the truth about prayer. There's a parable that is called the Midnight Caller, and Jesus teaches his disciples what the daily prayer life of a Christian should look like. And that's what we're going to read this morning. And so here's what we're going to do. Let us stand to our feet. I'm going to read God's word. Someone has said before that if you want to hear the audible voice of God, just read the word of God out loud. So that's what we're going to do. This is the authoritative, inerrant, infallible word of God. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That is God's word. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. 
And we ask you, just as the disciples asked you 2,000 years ago, Lord, can you teach us how to pray? Those who think they know how to pray need to learn how to pray. Lord, teach us, humble us, give us eyes to see your word and ears to hear it, Lord. And we ask you, what we know not this morning, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not, Lord, make us. Your word is truth, and so I pray, Lord, this morning, sanctify us by your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Most people uh, have heard the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, mostly from the Matthew 6 account. Um, And most people have heard verses 1 through 4 taught on this Lord's Prayer, but rarely have I heard preachers expound on the parable of the midnight caller. But this parable and this entire passage, I think, deserves a little context for us to to, kind of understand what is happening here. So we find in verse 1 of chapter 11 that Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him and asked him a question. This is interesting thing about Jesus. Every single time you see him come on the scene, he just got done doing what? Praying. It's not until he seeks to commune with the Father that proceeds, well, he'll, he'll preach or he'll heal or he'll perform some sort of miracle, but he's always getting done praying. He's always praying. But here's the thing. The disciples asked Jesus a really important question. They said, Jesus, can you teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray? Now, that's, that, that's, that's kind of interesting that they would ask it in that way. But there's a reason for that. There's not a lot of context that tells us that John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray other than this text. So he obviously did that. But the the context of that question is this. At this time, in biblical times, it it wouldn't have been abnormal for someone to seek out a master of a certain subject and ask them, hey, can you teach me about this particular subject in the scriptures? They would look for the master of that subject, if you will. And so the disciples, they sought Jesus because they knew that he was the master of prayer. Why? Because Jesus would have grown up with John the Baptist, and so who taught John the Baptist how to pray? It was Jesus. Jesus would have taught John the Baptist, and John the Baptist taught his disciples. And so they went straight to the master of prayer to learn how to pray. It was really wise of them. But here's another interesting thing in terms of context. Just two chapters before, Jesus sends out these 12 apostles to go out and preach the word of God and to heal. Essentially, Jesus sends them out on this evangelistic crusade. And at the end of, or actually in verse six of chapter nine, it says, and they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So just imagine that, right? They're preaching in power, they're healing everywhere, an incredible outreach evangelistic event. But then he does it again in chapter 10. He sends out 72 And then in verse 17, the 72 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, this is Jesus, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I don't know what kind of event that was, but Satan fell on that day. And guess what? I've seen God do that kind of work right here on our campus. But they were a part of this incredible outreach event, this evangelistic event, performing miracles, people getting saved. And when they get back, you would think that they would ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray or can you teach us how to preach better? Hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to evangelize more effectively? Hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to heal more consistently? You know, if it was us, that's what we would ask, wouldn't it? We would say, hey, God, can you help me how to do this better? But that's the first thing that I would think that they would ask Jesus. They would ask Jesus to help them how to preach or help them how to evangelize more effectively or help them how to heal more consistently. But that's not what they asked him. That's not what they asked him. What I found interesting in my studies was that the only time the disciples asked Jesus to teach them anything, it was right here. The only lesson that they wanted was a lesson on prayer. Think about that for just, in all of the Gospels, 
The disciples don't ask Jesus to teach them anything other than this question right here. Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? That's significant. Not how to preach better. Not how to evangelize more effectively. Not how to perform miracles more consistently. No, Jesus, we just want to learn how to commune the way you commune with the Father. Teach us to pray. And I believe it's because prayer is one of the most difficult things to learn as a follower of Christ. It's difficult to learn how to pray as Jesus prayed, steadfastly, praying without ceasing. It's more difficult than learning how to preach or make disciples or evangelize or perform any miracles. Prayer is what they asked Jesus for. And I'm convinced that prayer is the hardest lesson to learn because it's the easiest component of the Christian life to be overlooked, to be ignored, and to be practiced. Prayer is the easiest component of the Christian life to be overlooked and ignored and practiced. Why? Because as sinners, We live life with so much dependence on ourselves, on what we can do, on what we're able to do. But you see, the gospel changes all of that. The gospel not only directs us to depend on Christ alone for salvation, but the gospel also points us to our dependence on Christ through prayer as we live out the Christian life. We need Jesus for justification, and we need Jesus for sanctification through prayer. Dependence on God is not abstract, friends. The Bible clearly shows us that if you say you depend on God this morning, then you pray. Colossians 4.2 says, continue steadfast in prayer. 1 Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. If you say you depend on God, then you are saying that prayer is your first and last line of defense. If you say you depend on God, then you are saying that prayer is the most flourishing ministry in your life. Here's how Leonard Ravenhill puts it in a book called Why Revival Tarries. It's a classic prayer book. You need to get it if you don't have it. But I want to pause just on the very first sentence. No man is greater than his prayer life. I don't care how many degrees you have on your wall or what comes before your name. No man is greater than his prayer life. I've heard it said it this way, what you are in prayer, that is what you are and nothing else. Then he goes on and he says this, the pastor who was not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, few agonizers. Many players and payers, few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Hear this out. Failing here in prayer, we fail everywhere. Failing to pray as a church, we'll fail everywhere. Failing to pray as the head of my household, as a father and a husband. Listen, I'll fail everywhere. That's where he's getting to. There's a pastor by the name of Jim Cimbala who pastors a church called the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And the Brooklyn Tabernacle, they're known for two things. They're the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir and their Tuesday night prayer service. In his book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, which I also recommend, good book on prayer, he talks about planting a church where no one wanted to plant a church. It was, had addicts and prostitutes and all of these things. And he just said, well, we're going we, to plant there, but we're going to start with a Tuesday night prayer service. 
And they just began to pray. Listen, I've been to their prayer service. I know Pastor Dustin has as well. And it's the most incredible prayer experience I have ever had. I've only been once. And you have to get there early because there's a couple thousand people on a Tuesday night for prayer. Listen, we can barely get 50 in here once a month. I could barely get in. So they just decided to pray. That's how they wanted to plant their church. We gotta pray. And as they were praying every week, next thing you know, they had song. And next thing you know, it turns into the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. And next thing you know, they're planning a church and having Sunday services. But I love what he said in his book. He said this, that I don't measure, he said this right from the very start of his church, we don't measure the spiritual health of our church based on Sunday attendance. But we base the spiritual health on our church based on the Tuesday night attendance. Because that's where people are getting serious with God. That's where people are going and they're seeking the face of God. They're asking, they're knocking. They're seeking. And so listen, we are kicking off our 21 days of prayer. It's just to kick off the rest of the year. We're serious about prayer at our church, and we're going to have a prayer service tonight to kick it all off, and we're going to have another one at the end of the month. But here's the deal. Church, you being here tonight is serious because this is where we're going to seek the face of God. I don't know where your priorities are, but we need to reprioritize our priorities to be here to seek the face of God. And we need to lead our families in that way because this is the most serious business we have as a church is to go to God in prayer. So as you look over the next few months, we have these prayer services monthly. Hear me out. Look at your schedule. Talk as a family. Pray and be here. Because the righteous prayer of the faithful and fervent avails a lot. And so... I encourage you to be here tonight, (laughs) and I exhort you to. But it's not just for us. It's for you. It's for you. But this isn't a message on getting you to come to the prayer service tonight. (laughs) So Jesus gives us the the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer in verses 1 through 4, and he shows us the priorities of prayer. But then in the latter portion of this passage he gives us a parable on prayer and it's just a parable is just a story that this is how God communicates truth he communicates this truth Jesus did this often through parables by telling a story and this story reveals to us an important truth about prayer but it also teaches us what the daily prayer life of a Christian should look like But what is the truth that Jesus is communicating through this parable about prayer? Y'all ready? I'll give you the truth. That God answers prayer. Honestly, I thought you would be more excited about that. Like, God answers prayer. There is no greater motivation for the believer than knowing that the God we pray to answers the calls of his people. That gets me pumped up, ready to pray, because he answers the call of his children. So he teaches here the disciples what it looks like to depend on God in prayer by giving this parable. But if you guys would allow me, I want to give you this parable in the Arthur translation. Y'all ready for it? (laughs) A certain man received an unexpected guest in the middle of the night. I want you all to picture this. A certain man received an unexpected guest in the middle of the night. The unexpected guest was on a journey, but nightfall caught up with him. He had nowhere to stay, and all of his resources were depleted. So what did he do? He did what we would do. He turned to a friend who lived in the area. When the unexpected guest arrived, the host warmly welcomed him, and he says, my house is your house, or as we would say it, mi casa. Right. But as he made his unexpected guest comfortable, 
The host found himself in a crisis of hospitality. What was the crisis? There was no food in the house, and the marketplace would remain closed until morning. Here's what I realized about this parable. This was not a Portuguese family. Because if you showed up in the middle of the night to my house, in my parents' house, the pantry's full. We have enough food to last us through Armageddon. So this was not at all a Portuguese household. Anyways, that was a side note. Put that in your notes this morning. No food. The marketplace is cold until morning. What is this guy going to do? He didn't panic. I'll tell you that. He excused himself. Told his friend, just give me a minute. He excused himself and he went to his neighbor's house to borrow a couple of loaves until morning. Not thinking about the lateness of the hour, the midnight caller began to knock on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night. And the sleepy friend did what we would do in a tone that's probably not so Jesus-like. And he said, who is it? And the midnight caller identified himself. He said, hey, hey, neighbor, it's me. And he explained his dilemma. He says, here's my problem right now. I have an unexpected guest. I have an empty bread basket. And the market is closed until morning. Now, the midnight caller was sure that these facts would spring his friend into action. He was wrong. The sleepy friend said, Leave me alone. It, listen, man, it's been a long day. The door is locked. I have my kids in bed with me. I understand. I cannot get up and give you anything. Why don't you just come back in the morning? The sleepy friend then stopped talking. He didn't think he had to say anything else. He just thought, hey, man, that guy, I've said everything I needed to say. He'll go away, right? Wrong. The midnight caller knocked again. And he knocked again. Louder and louder and louder and louder. He didn't stop. It was as if he was trying to wake up the whole neighborhood, not even just his sleepy friend. It was an embarrassing display for both the midnight caller and the sleepy friend. So someone had to put an end to all of this madness. So the sleepy friend, he got out of bed, and he gave his neighbor several loaves of bread. But hear me out. He didn't do it out of friendship. He bribed the midnight caller with bread. He paid off his shameless neighbor with loaves so he could get back to sleep. The sleepy friend was willing to give anything he had at that God-forsaken hour just to get back to bed. The end. <laughs> That's the parable Jesus gave to the disciples about prayer. What it looks like to have a prayer life and, and the truth about prayer. When I heard that parable the first time, the first verse that came to my mind was James 5.16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That was the first verse that came to my mind. Jesus was teaching us what the daily prayer life of a Christian should look like. Here's what he was teaching. Effective prayer requires steadfast dependence upon God. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Effective prayer requires steadfast dependence upon God. And I'm convinced that you really can't pray any other way. In fact, hear me, you won't pray without a sense of dependence. Because need drives us to God in prayer. It doesn't matter how much you know about prayer. If you, if you are not aware of your neediness and God's sufficiency, you will never learn to pray. Daniel Henderson, who spoke at our BBFI conference early last year, he says this in a book, prayerlessness is a declaration of independence. Prayerlessness is a declaration of independence. 
needy people pray. The story of the midnight caller and the sleepy friend teaches us to be fervent in prayer. It teaches us that needy people pray. But it also raises two questions about how our prayer life reveals our level of dependence upon God. But here's the first question, and it might seem really ridiculous at first, but it's it's an earnest question for you this morning. Do you pray? (laughs) You see, the midnight caller, when he had that unexpected guest with no food in the pantry and the market was closed, I want you to realize something. Did he hesitate to go to his neighbor's house? Y'all can answer it. It's not a trick question. In church, I know we do that a lot. We trick you. You can say Jesus in a, more, more than nine times out of ten, it'll be right. But he instinctively, the midnight, the midnight caller instinctively went to his neighbor's house to pray. Is this what you do in prayer, church? When you have a problem you cannot solve. Do you pray about it? When your friends come to you with a need, do you pray about it? When it's midnight in your life, do you pray about it? Or do you give up? Or do you try to face the problem on your own? Or do you pray? H.B. Charles Jr. once said in a sermon of his, The first commitment one must make in prayer is to commit to not stop praying once one gets started. (laughs) The first commitment we have to make as a church in this 21 days of prayer thing is to commit, church, to not stop praying. That's why Colossians 4 says, continue steadfast. That's why it says, pray without ceasing. Jesus says, continue to be watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. We have to commit to not stop praying. The parable of the midnight caller teaches us that the daily life of a, the daily prayer life of a Christian should be earnest and diligent and persistent Do you have a sense of dependence upon God that will cause you to knock on the door until you get what you need? Do you pray as if everything depends on God? Do you pray this way? But the second question this parable raises is this. How do you pray? It doesn't just challenge us to pray. It doesn't just exhort us to pray. But it teaches us to pray in a manner that will open up closed doors. And really, there's one word in this parable that unlocks the whole meaning of the parable. And it's found in Luke 11, verse 8. Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence... He will rise and give him whatever he needs. I know this word isn't used a lot in our vocabulary, but this word impudence unlocks the meaning of this whole parable. The King James Version translates it importunity. The New King James Version translates it persistence. And the New International Version translates it boldness. But the CSB Version breaks it all the way down to its very definition. And he says, because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Shameless boldness. That's all that that word impudence means. It simply means to be without shame. Common sense and good manners and personal respect should have made the midnight caller give up when his sleepy friend said he would not and could not help him. But shameless boldness made the midnight caller continue to knock. Why? Because he was needy. And neediness drives us to pray 
impudently, with persistence and boldness. You see, The neighbor was the one who had bread. He was his only option. And so he prayed. He went over there and knocked until that sleepy friend gave him what he needed. There was no shame in his game. It didn't matter if he woke up everyone in the town. He was determined to keep knocking until his sleepy friend opened the door and gave him the bread he needed. So Jesus is teaching his disciples and teaching us this morning to pray this way, to pray shamelessly, with shameless boldness, impudently. You know what? Let me break that down one layer. He's teaching us to pray like beggars. I don't think a lot of us like the idea of going to the Lord in prayer like a beggar. Listen, I know by the grace of God in the last few months, I've come to know a lot of our homeless friends here. And I see a lot of them on the medium and they have a sign and they're asking for money because they need that money to get their next meal. And so they will stay out there as long as they have to, regardless of the weather, just to get enough money to get some Popeye's chicken across the street. And this is how Jesus is teaching his people to pray. We live in a culture, though, that hates to appear in need. Appearing to be helpless or needy in our culture is a sign of weakness. But the truth is, is that the facade of not appearing needy is just living proof of how sinfully prideful we are as a people, even when it's masked in humility. But the truth is, is that sinful pride murders believing prayer. You will never take prayer seriously as long as you are looking for face-saving alternatives to get what you need. Hear me, friends. You cannot seek God's face and save your face at the same time. Could this be why God allows us to have an unexpected guest with an empty pantry in the middle of the night in our lives? Listen, life is easy when people schedule to come over. My wife tells me all the time, make sure they put it on the schedule. It's easy when people come over scheduled and and, and it's during the day where we can get more food if we run out. But it's also easy to forget where our help comes from. But God, by his great mercy and grace in 2020, taught us that the unexpected forces us to humble ourselves and seek God for what only he can provide. Neediness, y'all hear what I'm saying? Neediness is the key element to a healthy prayer life. Are you coming to Christ needy this morning? Repent of your self-sufficiency And confess your need for God. Say, Christ, without you I have nothing. I am nothing. I need you more than anything and anyone. I need you more than the air that I breathe. That's where you got to get to. That's what the daily prayer life of a Christian looks like. Needy. Fully dependent on God. Praying shamelessly. But God also teaches this great truth in this parable. The great truth of the parable is that God is not a sleepy friend. What I love about what Jesus is teaching here is that unlike the anti-hero in this parable, God is not a sleepy friend. Psalm 121, 3 through 4 says this, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Praise God. If a sleepy friend would get up to answer the door, listen, friends, how much more will our God meet our needs when we pray? And some of you are at the midnight hour of your life and you want to give up. God hasn't come through. 
But here's my encouragement to you, friends. Don't stop praying. Keep praying because God is not a sleepy friend. And the truth that Jesus teaches his disciples is that God answers prayers. There was this story of a woman that went to a local produce stand to buy grapes. And she, when she got there, the, the line was really long. Don't y'all hate that when you get to Starbucks and there's cars wrapped around the corner? It's frustrating. But she got there and that's exactly how it was. There was so many people in line and, 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 and she saw that the farmer was working as fast as he could, but it was still frustrating to her. But when she got to the front of the line, the farmer said, just give me a minute, and he went out back. I don't know why, but that always happens to me at Dunkin' Donuts. But when the farmer left, she started to grow impatient. She started to get frustrated. How dare he do that? He better come back quickly. She, she almost got out of line. She was ready to go. But then the farmer finally reappeared. And he had a big smile on his face. And he presented her with the most beautiful grapes she had ever seen. As a matter of fact, he invited her to taste one. She had never tasted grapes so good. And as she turned to leave with her delicious grapes, he stopped her and he says, ma'am, just one second. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. But I needed the time to get you my very best. How long have you been in line waiting on God to get your requests? How long have you been in line waiting for God to answer your prayer? How long have you been in line waiting for God to meet a need or solve a problem or open the door? Hear me out, friends. Whatever you do, don't get out of line. Don't allow your heart to become angry and impatient or bitter as you wait on God. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Listen, as Christians, the best thing we can do to encourage each other is to encourage each other to not give up on prayer. Keep praying. It's easy to pray when everything is great, but it's hard to pray when everything is falling apart. But Jesus says, know this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Come on, church. That's an incredible truth. He goes on and he says, what father among you if a son asks for a fish, well, instead of a fish, give him a serpent. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Jesus assumes that a good Father will take care of his children's basic needs. Philippians 4.19, you got to remember this. you gotta, you got to learn this to memory. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Y'all want to hear the main word there? He will. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I would say, he will. Just as a reminder, he will provide. But here's the thing, church. I love that Jesus ends and he says, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's important. For those in here this morning who don't know the Lord Jesus, if you're watching online and you've never called on the name of the Lord to be saved, if you've never confessed that Christ was righteous for you, that Christ died in your stead for the forgiveness of your sins and that Christ rose from the grave and is sitting on the throne right now and he will come back for his church. If you've never confessed that Jesus is Lord, this morning you can do that and be saved. 
and you ready? And you get the Holy Spirit. He delights in pouring out his spirit to those who call on his name. Why is that significant? Because we were never made to walk out this Christian life on our own. We desperately need the Holy Spirit to be the kind of people who pray without ceasing. Do you think you can pray without ceasing without the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. You need the Holy Spirit to pray without ceasing. And so this morning, we get the third person of the Trinity. We have God residing in us as Christians. And the Spirit intercedes for us even when we don't have the words to put together to talk with God. Romans 8 said, he intercedes for us. Even when our groanings are too deep, he steps in and intercedes with us, intercedes with the Father. And this morning, maybe you're without words. You don't even know what to pray at this stage of your life. Know that the Holy Spirit will intercede for you. Y'all get what I'm saying? He will search your heart, and he will pray according to God's will on your behalf this morning. And so, Christians, here's my charge to you. You ready? Here's what we got to do this year. Commit to not stop praying. Can y'all do that? Can we get an amen if y'all going to do that? We need to commit. The first thing we need to do this year as we kick off 21 days of prayer is to commit to not stop praying. So here's what we're going to do now. We're going to pray to end our time. We're going to pray and ask God. Maybe there's something in your life. I just want you to get together with your family or, or your friends that you came here with or online. I want you to first and foremost go before the Lord and I want you to ask. I want, maybe there's something that you feel is too little or too big, but God says, bring it to me. Ask and you will receive. And maybe you've grown weary. But right now, just for 20 seconds, let us go before the Lord and ask. Lord, thank you that you remind us that if we come to you and ask that we will receive, Lord. You even teach us how to pray for our daily bread. There's not a prayer too small or too big. You actually answer beyond what we ask, is what Ephesians says, or think or imagine. And so, God, we come to you, and maybe we've been reluctant because we haven't fully depended on you. Or maybe, God, we've, we've thought that this... This prayer request of asking was too small. But God, right now, I come before you and I ask that you would work in power in those areas in my life, Lord, in the areas in our lives, Lord, where we're reluctant to ask. May we ask with confidence this morning, knowing that you delight in giving to us yes. according to your riches and glory. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's go before the Lord and let's seek him. And maybe it's as you look at your life, there's certain areas in your life where, where you're not seeking him. Maybe there's some repentance that is required this morning. And you need to come before the Lord and say, forgive me for not seeking you in this area of my life. Yes. Or maybe seeking just means that, God, I'm seeking for your wisdom. I'm seeking for your mercy and your love that I might show that to others. But let us go now before the Lord in prayer and seek him. Lord, thank you that you tell us in Scripture that you reward those who diligently seek you. And as Isaiah 55 was read this morning, that to seek you while you may be found. And in that, just two verses later, you say your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your way is not our way. So much higher are yours. And so, God, we come before you now, and we seek you, Lord. We, we want to dwell in your presence Lord, we, wanna, we want you to be first in every facet of our lives. Lord, forgive us, Lord. We repent of not making you 
the center of attention in every area of our lives, making you first in every area of our lives. Lord, whatever that area is, I pray that we would repent and turn to you and make you first. And Lord, we seek for your wisdom this morning. With all the political turmoil and so much going on in our world, we need your wisdom. Lord, I pray that you would give us your mercy and love and grace that we might be able to show it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. And lastly, let us knock at the door. Now, maybe you got a couple doors closed on you recently. But Jesus says, hey, friend, don't stop knocking. Keep knocking until I open the door. Like the parable of the midnight caller. This is how he wants it. This is the time to pray impudently. This is the time to pray with shameless boldness. God says, I love it when you do it. So come before me now as if everything depends on me, God says. Let us go before him right now. What is it? Let us knock at the door. Yes, Lord, we knock. We're knocking. Help us, Lord, to be a people who pray with shameless boldness. A people who pray as if everything depends on you coming through or else we're doomed. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that we would have the kind of prayer life that would be like a beggar that would not stop until we get what we need. And so, Jesus, whatever that door is for, for those who are in this building and those who are watching online, I pray that right now we would knock, that maybe it would begin uh, to, to form our prayer life to be a knocking kind of people that keep knocking until the Lord comes through. So, God, you know those doors. You know the ones that are shut, and you know the ones you're going to open. But right now, God, we ask that you open the door. We know that when you open it, it's going to be good, and it's going to bring you glory. But we ask now, shamelessly, because <laughs> that's how you taught us to pray. Open the door, Lord Jesus. Open the door. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I just want us to sing this song as a prayer this morning, a declaration of our neediness. <laughs> So I was convicted this morning specifically. As Arthur mentioned, sometimes God brings the unexpected into our life to reveal our need. And uh, there's a couple unexpected things that have popped up in my life recently, some financial things and car problems, you know the stuff, the unexpected things. And I thought, well, if I do this, and if I do this, and if I do this, we'll take care of that. And then we do Right? That's what we do. But sometimes... Maybe all the time, if the God we serve is a sovereign God, those unexpected things are meant to reveal our neediness and our cleverness gets in the way. So this morning, for me, I thought of some specific unexpected things and, I, and maybe for you, there's some unexpected things that can just remind you and reveal your need for him there's some of us that we know our pride keeps us from coming to the Lord. And there's some of us who we've just given up. We need a little more shameless boldness. And this morning, I hope you'll be encouraged in that. But why don't you stand with me as we are gonna close and we're gonna just sing this song as a declaration of the reality of what we heard this morning. Hi, I'm Pastor Dustin Janney. Thank you so much for joining us online for worship today. If something spoke to you from the message or if you have a question about it, we'd love for you to share that with us. Just comment below or send us a message. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we are so excited for you. We believe there is no more important decision you could make. 
We'd love to connect with you and help you take your next steps in following Jesus. Again, thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope to see you soon.